Welcome to our revision lecture on R4S2. Before we look at our revision page of R4S2, I want you to please refer to this handout included on Call Campus. When you look at the details of this handout, you will be able to refer to your Part B textbook. And everything that is included on this page, you will be able to obtain from the paragraphs, which is R4S2, IG4, and IG24. You will identify everything included in the paragraphs are included on this page. Why do I indicate this to you? Because when you need to study your revision page, you will be able to link this to the information in your textbook and this will decrease the time that you have to spend and ensure that you flag these pages properly. Now I want you to please refer to our R4S2 revision page Welcome to our R4S2 revision page. I'm pretty confident by now that you are able to read and understand the flow of our revision pages. Now, let's just take this one step back. What do we want to achieve with this revision page? First, we need to identify what is a share-based payment transaction. Then, what is the different types of share-based payment transactions? How do we account for a share-based payment transaction? And when do we account for a share-based payment transaction? First, we will look at what is a share-based payment transaction, guys. And this will be our number one in red in the middle of the page. Now, when you look at the black box, you will identify that I've included an arrow between two entities or two parties, which will be one this should be an agreement between an entity and another party to transfer goods or services to the entity. And in return for these goods or services, our entity will transfer either equity instruments or cash. Now remember, I make use of pictures. If you do not like this or you prefer to use words, please add your words. When we refer to other parties, you need to be able to identify that a other party can represent an employee. And therefore, an employee will provide a service to the entity. When you recognize employee costs, let's just think about our basic journal entry. We will have to debit our employee expenses in our profit and loss and credit our bank and outflow of cash. Let me move on to our next step, different types of share-based payment transactions. You will identify all of our light pink boxes. First, there will be equity settled share-based payment transactions or this can be cash settled or a choice between equity and cash. Now, when you refer to our definition block, if our other party, let's say for example, is our employee, provide a service, and in return for that service, the entity will pay with equity instruments. Our equity instruments, we then need to identify that this will be equity settled. If our employee provides a service and our entity pay the service, now I'm using the word pay, which is not really a payment, guys. It's a plan, it's an agreement for the service in terms of cash. This will be cash settled. When you identify in any question that they refer to share appreciation rights, you need to immediately know that this will be cash settled. Now, a share appreciation right is a plan that the entity enters into with its employees to pay cash should certain conditions be met. Now, our next step, how do we account for the different types of share-based payment transactions? When you look at only our equity settled, you will remember our basic journal entry when there's employee costs will be to debit our employee cost and our profit and loss. And when we now need to accrue or provide, guys, for the equity to be settled, 
we will have to credit our share-based payment reserve in our statement of changes in equity. I want you to think about this. If you need to prepare your statement of changes in equity, please refer to the left side of your screen. This is your statement of changes in equity. You will remember that we need to include a column for our share capital, a column for our retained earnings, revaluation reserves, and so forth. If there is an equity settled share-based payment transaction, you will have to add share-based payment reserve. And this will be our equity settled transaction. Another column, please refer to our cash settled. If this is a cash settled share-based payment transaction, we will debit our goods or services. If the services is employee costs, employee costs, profit and loss account, and we will credit a cash reserve liability. The third type, a choice of either equity or cash settled, we will discuss a little bit later. Now I want to refer you to number four. When do we account for our share-based payment transactions? When there is a service, when the service is delivered, when there is goods or assets, when control of our goods or assets are transferred. Before we look at the details regarding our types of share-based payment transactions, I briefly want to discuss a few important definitions included in RFRS 2. Now on the left side of your screen, you will identify that I've included the word grant date. Now the grant date will be the date when our two parties enters into our agreement and agree to the terms and the conditions of the agreement. Then two, measurement date. You will have to identify if this is a transaction with the employee or with other parties. If this is a transaction with an employee, you need to know that your measurement date and your grant date will be exactly the same date. If this is with other parties, you need to know that your measurement date will be the date that the goods or services are delivered. Then, definition number three, a vesting condition. A vesting condition is a condition that should be met before they are able to transfer the equity or cash. Then when we refer to a vesting period, this will normally be when our employee has to provide a service for a certain number of years, a period. And we call this a performance condition that should be satisfied. I want you to only focus on equity settled share based payment transactions. We are only going to look at equity settled now. When you have identified that there's equity settled, now how do you do this? You need to read. If they talk about share options, shares, you need to know that this will be equity settled. If they talk about share appreciation rights, you need to know cash settled. Now, when you have identified that this is equity settled, you need to be able to, to distinguish between a transaction with an employee or number two with other parties. Now this is extremely important. When you have identified that this is a transaction with an employee, you need to know your rules guys, therefore you need to study the principles. You need to immediately know that you need to measure this at fair value on grant date. Measurement is your calculation. Now, if this is a transaction with other parties and there's goods or services involved, you need to use the fair value of the goods or services on measurement date. Okay. Then your next question. Now I'm going to include question one, guys, the red Q1. Question 
Two, is there any vesting conditions? A vesting condition will be a performance condition. Therefore, one, if this is no, then you need to know that the share-based payment transaction will vest immediately. If yes, you need to identify if this is non-market or a market condition. But first, guys, I want you to stop and let's look at a very basic example. On your left bottom side, you will identify a table. Now, this is my recommendation. Always, always make use of a table. In this example, you need to include your years, your number of employees, number of options, if this is, equity settled, vesting period if there is any, your fair value or your price, and six share based payment reserve, column number seven, your profit and loss. In this example, we have one employee that will be entitled to 30 options. There is a vesting period of two years, meaning that our employee must remain in employment for a period of two years. Therefore, include two years. The fair value, important guys, this is a transaction with an employee. Therefore, we need to use our fair value on grant date. And our fair value on grant date will be five rand. Important on grant date. Why? because this is a transaction with an employee. Therefore, our share-based payment reserve, we should be able to calculate. But how do you calculate this if there is a vesting period? For year one, you need to recognize the amount over the vesting period. Therefore, you will have to times this by one over two. For year two, the total share-based payment reserve shall now be for the total two years. At the end of year one, our share-based payment reserve will be 75 Rand. Therefore, should you need to disclose this in your statement of changes in equity, on your left side, you will identify that I've included an extract. Your opening balance for year two will be the 75 Rand. Year two, closing balance, guys. Our total will be an amount of 150. It's one employee times 30 options times two over two times five Rand, and this will be 150, and this will be your closing balance for year two. And then when we need to recognize this for the relevant year end for year end one you need to recognize 75 rand you will have to debit your employee costs in your profit and loss and credit your share based payment reserve with a 75 when you need to recognize for year two your journal entry will be to debit your employee cost credit your share based payment reserve with how much with 75 which is the movement from 75 to 150 75 therefore 75 and in your statement of changes in equity an adjustment of 75 rand this will be when there is a vesting period now, what will happen if there's no vesting period? There is no vesting period in this example. Now, please look at the bottom left side of your screen. Exactly the same information. We have one employee, 30 options, vesting period none. This is a transaction with an employee. Therefore, we need to use our fair value on grant date and this is five rand and our total share-based payment reserve will be 150 
we need to recognize in our profit and loss 150 therefore our journal entry will be to debit our employee cost with 150 credit our share base payment reserve with a 150. now this is the main difference between vesting period yes and vesting period no now i want you to please look at our vesting period yes section i want you to please refer to the green block yes there is a vesting condition therefore we need to recognize over vesting period and then you need to be able to identify between non-market conditions and two market conditions now to explain this briefly a market condition will be a condition in an agreement that relates to the share price of the entity therefore the share price should reach a certain amount before the shares will be able to vest. A non-market condition will refer to turnover, sales, that should include, increase with a certain percentage. Now, non-market conditions not taken into account as no amount is recognized if the vesting condition is not satisfied. But guys, you will not take into account in your calculation and you will then not recognize this because the vesting condition is not satisfied. Where with a market condition, good services received will be recognized regardless of whether the vesting condition is satisfied or not. Therefore, yes, you will have to recognize a market condition even if the vesting condition is not satisfied. Compared to a non-market condition, if the vesting condition is not satisfied, you will not take this into account in your calculation and you will not recognize a share-based payment transaction.